Yeah, you got three hours. Okay, let's get started, folks. Uh, we're already starting late, and that's not your fault. That's uh, just because the last panel ran long, but hopefully we can catch up with the schedule. Hopefully by the end of this panel, we'll see how, depends on how lively you are. Uh, so, this is a panel to discuss proposed exemptions four and five. Uh, we actually have proponents only for class, well, initially we only had proponents only for class four. Since we have an opponent for class five who wanted to speak here, a proponent for class five has elected to come out here to respond. So, here's going to be the order. Um, Aaron Williamson, uh, proponent for class four, followed by Jay Solzberger and Brett Wincoop, also proponents for class four, followed by uh, do, you have, do you have a preference who goes first? Jesse Bader, uh, an opponent of class four and five. And finally, well not finally, Steve Metallis, an opponent of class four. And finally, Marsha Hoffman, who spoke in California, but uh, is being given an opportunity here to address anything said by the opponents at this meeting. So with that, uh, let's start with Aaron. Thanks, David. Um, as I said, my name is Eric Williams. I'm uh, an attorney with the Software Freedom Law Center. I represent copyright owners. Um, my clients produce freedom of source software for uh, distribution to the general public under generous copyright terms. Uh, I'm here to propose the exemption for computer programs that enable the installation and execution of lawfully obtained software on personal computing devices, where circumvention is performed by or at request of the device. Essentially, I'm here to propose an exemption. My clients to produce software for, for uh, available hardware. This exemption is an expansion of the mobile phone jailbreaking exemption granted uh, after the 2009 ruling. That exemption was granted on July 26, 2010, and since the market for applications has expanded uninterrupted. Apple, the primary opponent of that exemption, has now seen more than 25 billion applications sold in its app store. The Android market has sold well over 10 billion. And as intended, the exemption has bolstered the market for applications that aren't approved by Apple for inclusion in the App Store. As uh, my colleague at the Electronic Frontier Foundation pointed out, Cydia, the third party store uh, available only to owners of jailbroken devices, has been accessed through 50 million different iOS devices. When the 2000 rulemaking began, smartphones were relatively new. The iPhone had only been released the previous year, and the first Android phone was two months old. Now, a mere three years later, the majority of Americans own smartphones. This incredible growth has spurred the introduction of other types of mobile computing devices that have themselves become ubiquitous in the last three years. The iPad, for example, was introduced on April 3rd, 2010, four months before the Library of Congress granted the jailbreaking exemption for smartphones. Today, over 67 million iPads have been sold. The Amazon Kindle, in its infancy during the 2009 rulemaking, has been through six different models and by the end of last year was selling a million units per week. These new devices, along with video game consoles, personal music players, set-top boxes, smart watches, and a host of other new personal computing platforms, have in a very short time supplanted the personal computer for a number of common uses. Perhaps the best example of this can be seen right here in this room. Uh, at the technology demonstration hearing, I counted at least three people taking notes on their iPads rather than on a laptop. But people are using personal computing devices like tablets and smartphones in place of personal computers for most common computing tasks. They read emails on smartphones and ebook readers, they browse the web and produce art on iPads, and they track the progress of their exercise routine on smartwatches that talk to their smartphones, which sync to their tablets. The personal computer has had a good run, but the personal computing device is a symbol. But just as Apple and the iPhone produce the momentum behind this wave of new devices, they also set a trend that endangers innovation. The lockdown that Apple imposed on the iPhone, which prevented users from installing any software that hadn't been pre-approved by Apple, and ensured that Apple would face no competition to its star applications, is now an industry standard. Android phones are largely considered more open devices than iPhones, but nearly every Android phone available prevents users from replacing the operating system or from accessing select functionality. All mass market e-readers are locked down almost identically to the iPhone, prohibiting the installation of non-approved applications and aftermarket operating systems. The same is true for video game consoles. These locks have become so ubiquitous on mobile computing devices 
but in the last three years, they have found their way back to traditional personal computers, a class of devices previously quite open to third-party innovation. Microsoft is leading the way in this, recognizing that the smaller, lighter computers of the future will run on the ARM architecture, a favorite platform for mobile devices, rather than on Intel chips. Microsoft recently mandated that any ARM-based Windows device must irreversibly prevent users from installing unapproved operating systems. This policy applies not only to Windows phones and tablets, but also to the new class of ultralight notebooks already being produced by such vendors as Qualcomm and Asus. Microsoft is also taking a page from Apple's App Store book and will only allow the next generation of Windows applications, called Metro applications, to be sold through the Windows Store. These locks are often built by operating system vendors as security features, but their primary purpose and effect is to impede competition. Personal computers were fertile ground for innovation application and operating system markets because people were free to innovate on top of the hardware available to them. They didn't need to make deals with hardware vendors in order to produce a competing software product. The locks imposed on new devices close this route to innovation, which is the route taken by most of the software success stories of our time. Microsoft, Apple, and Google made their first millions building software for available hardware, unimpeded by any effort by the hardware operating system. As we heard at the tech demo hearing, Mozilla cannot count on having the same, uh, yeah, cannot have the same opportunity to enter the mobile operating system and mobile browser markets. They were able to build their boot to get go operating system because this proceeding made it legal for them to gain administrative access to modern smartphones that were already available to test them. They were able to produce a stable version of the Firefox browser for Android for the same reason. But while every other mobile operating system vendor, including Microsoft has adapted their operating systems to tablets after tackling smartphones. Mozilla will have trouble doing the same, because while tablet computers are essentially identical to smartphones except in their size and marketing, it is not legal to circumvent the same locks on tablets that it is on smartphones. The same goes for ebook readers, personal music players, and the whole generation of devices you have yet to see. In this way, locks, to, locks serve to protect, protect incumbents who have relationships with hardware manufacturers that are unavailable to from competition from new entrants like this one. I expect that the first thing you notice about this exemption is that it appears to be quite broad. But I believe that it's only as broad as necessary to enable innovation on the new generation of computers. The devices that are replacing personal computers are not susceptible to simple categorization, since it was made apparent at the hearing for tablet computer exemption proposed by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. The line between a tablet and an ebook reader, for example, both are handheld computers, usually larger than a phone and smaller than a laptop with a prominent display. Uh, but what makes the iPad a tablet and the Kindle Fire an ebook reader is entirely a matter of the software installed on each by the manufacturer. The same is true for the line between a smartphone and a tablet. The primary distinction is size. Many tablets even contain cellular antennas identical to those of phones. Tablets are usually bigger, but new, new devices like the Samsung Note have largely erased that distinction. The application is available are essentially identical. I could go on, but the point is that these devices are all personal computers with different inputs, outputs, and default configurations. They are used for a set of tasks that overlap broadly from one device to another, and the justifications for and interest in jailbreaking each of them are the same as they are for smartphones. Addressing each new type of device piecemeal via this process not only doesn't make any sense given the lack of distinction between the devices, it would critically burden innovation, leaving follow-on innovators like Mozilla a minimum of three years behind incumbents in producing software for new devices. To understand this, we can look at the iPad. It was released during the last notice and comment process and before the uh, ruling was made. And by the time of the ruling, over three million of them had been sold with all of the same restrictions as the iPhone. The devices were nearly identical, and all of the same reasons to grant an exemption applied on the day it was released. But nonetheless, hope the developers had to wait three years to even ask for the right to innovate on top of the iPad platform. This is not how innovation happens. Finally, the exemption's inherent limitations foreclose unintended consequences. It allows circumvention only for the installation of licensed software, not even for the modification of restricted software, and only on hardware owned by the user. I usually grant proposed exemption, which is well within your authority in this rulemaking, and is essential to innovation. Thank you very much. Um,
Salzburg and Sterling Cruz. Hi there. Uh, Brett Weinkoop from New Yorkers for Fair Use. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying that uh, I am what might be considered a, a copyright Nazi. I believe in strong traditional copyright, but uh, the DMCA has much less to do with copyright than it does control. Uh, my term of art for this law is the Digital Millennium Control Act because it gives control of your personal computing devices to the person that you bought the device from. Uh, as Aaron so aptly pointed out in his opening statement, uh, most of the smaller computing devices, physically smaller computing devices these days, uh, prevent the owner from installing the software they wish to install for their own purposes. Uh, the only reason to lock these devices up that way is, as Eric said, to allow the incumbents to have control over your computing environment uh, rather than for you to have control over your computing environment. I have several of these small devices myself, uh, and it's absolutely vexing that it's a crime to use them as I wish to use them. It is my tool. I have purchased it. I have taken it home from the store. So it should be up to me to employ my tool the way I wish to employ it. Uh, it's not it's not really correct to say, oh, well, you can only use your computing device the way the vendor you bought it from said. In that, in that case, you don't own the computing device. You have leased the computing device. You have purchased, um, essentially, uh, a, a limited right to make only certain use of it. Uh, from the standpoint of uh, innovation, the, it definitely locks out small companies. I work for a company in New York City called Hera Partners. Uh, our primary business is designing e-commerce websites, but a secondary business we have, because our customers have asked us to do this, is to design tablet applications for both the iPad and Android tablets. The unfortunate thing is, if the incumbents in those markets, namely Apple and Google, decide, oh, we don't want that application in our official store, then you're locked out of the market because not everybody in the country is going to go through the process of breaking the encryption on their device to allow the device to accept the software they want it to accept. Uh, the personal computer revolution came about in the 80s because mainframes were, by design, very restrictive, and it was very time-consuming to get anything changed on an application running on a mainframe at, at your company. So as the personal computer got more powerful, uh, there were upstarts that began innovating, and that's where we got, for instance, spreadsheets. That's where we got word processors. That's where we got a whole slew of applications that we all take for granted today. And it was because small personal computing devices that are much less powerful then this computer that I've got in my pocket were open and people could put on the software they wanted and experiment the way they wanted to innovate. Uh, to a first approximation, I don't believe that the Digital Millennium Control Act even belongs on the books in the United States of America, but the reality is we have this odious piece of legislation that our lawmakers so ill-advisedly passed, and we have to come down to Washington every three years to beg, literally beg, to be allowed to use our computing devices. Uh, it's wrong. 
I also don't believe that we should have uh, different classes of exemption for computing devices of different physical sizes. Uh, as Aaron said, it's a computer, whether it's physically this big, or whether it's this big, or whether it's as big as the room. It's a computer. The computer I'm holding in my hand today is many, many orders of magnitude more powerful than the computer that I used on my first job as a Unix system administrator that was supporting several hundred users in database searches. So just the fact that the exemptions have to be laid out by how, what the physical size of the computer is is ludicrous. And I would urge you to allow the citizens of the United States of America to have private ownership of their computers and to have the ability to employ their computers the way they wish to employ them. Now this is not to say that every citizen of the United States is going to legally employ their computer, but every citizen of the United States does not legally employ their automobile. Every citizen of the United States does not legally employ their handgun. Every citizen of the United States does not legally employ any particular tool that man has come up with in the last many thousands of years. So to, to outlaw a class of tools because some people may not employ them legally is just totally wrong. Instead, the focus should be on, oh, somebody has done an illegal act. Let's shut that person down. Let's put that person uh, before the judicial system appropriately. But don't criminalize the citizens of the United States because they want to use their tools to build and produce. I make my living off of copyrighted works. As a matter of fact, I produced three copyrighted works last week that I got paid for. I'm a firm believer in copyright law, but I'm not a believer in prior restraint of how you can use your tools. Jack? Thanks. OK, I'm next, of course. Yeah. Um, I guess what I want to say is it's going to be very much along the lines of what Aaron and Brett said. And I, I, I want to emphasize two things. It's that there's a broad, general misunderstanding of what's at issue here in the newspapers, and, and certainly, I think it is mainly a misunderstanding on the part of the people against such exemption. It isn't about copyright. As both Brett and Aaron said, it's not about copyright. It's about the issue of the right of ownership of a computer. Now, um, Bunny Wong wrote two comments. Bunny Wong is a hot shot maybe the most distinguished hardware cracker. He's also a designer of hardware, which is cryptographically protected against um, people who don't have the right of access to devices. He's, um, he submitted one comment in his own person. He submitted a second one. He asked people to sign 25,000 people signed his comment, which was in favor of these exemptions. Um, he certainly mentioned exemption four, and therefore I have forgotten, which I also agree very much that, as a matter of, uh, as both of our sides just said, for me, both people have said, oh, yeah, look, this is a big, heavy computer with a big screen, because my eyes are going, and because I like to, to have a lot of storage, and have to be actually able to compute sometimes. But it's the same thing modulo the gross human interface and how much it weighs as that thing. And it, it, oh, maybe that thing will weaken in some directions, but you know, by two years from now, it won't be. And let me just, what I want to draw attention to is, now, now this is speculative, but um, and uh, it might be felt to be out of place. There, there's an implicit, the arguments on the other side, um, there's all sorts of implicit theories about how they won't be able to make it money anymore if these exemptions are granted. Let me say, by the way, that I think it, granting the exemptions may result in a certain number of people using their computers and their connections to that to commit massive copyright violations, just as I think people still occasionally rob banks, and they often use a car to get away. 
Um, so, let's see, what can I say about it? The issue just isn't one of copyright, and let me tell you why it can't be. Oh, sorry, I should have quoted Bert. Bernie uh, Wong said, if these exemptions aren't granted, the present bright line of ownership, that's what he called it, bright line of ownership. You walk into the store 10 years ago when I bought a computer, I walked out of the store, it was mine. Now, most people don't fool with their computers, they don't get control of it. That's partly the reason these exemptions aren't granted and why the DMCA was passed. If you run Windows under copyright law, you're not allowed to, um, you're allowed to look at it and disassemble the operating system and modify it. You're not allowed to publicize, if that's a mistake, of the results of your work. But be that as it may, um, in practice, people don't actually, most of them, hack on the lower levels of their Windows operating system. But some of us do. Well, I don't do it in Windows, but I do it in other systems. Sometimes I touch the metal. Okay? I don't do it often. It's not my job. Sometimes I modify the kernel and run a modified kernel. Um, the right of ownership is not clear in people's minds because in practice, they don't exercise their rights in that direction. Just as most people don't take apart their car engine and rebore the cylinders. But they own the car. I think it's still true that we have the right in America, because it's a right of property and a very important one, we get to rebore the cylinders. Now, that doesn't mean that we get to drive over the speed limit, or get to run over people, or get to make too much noise. I'm all in favor of those things. I'm all in favor of the actually much stricter enforcement of many of those laws, and greater limits. But something in my house that I bought that once upon a time now this thing, the ancestor of it, was a general purpose computer which I control. The idea that to prevent speculative, in my case, I would never, ever commit a copyright violation. I've never downloaded a popular song. I've either one that I pay for, and hopefully some of the money gets to the artist, although that's doubtful in practice, you know. Um, nor one that people have made available, people making available have probably committed a copyright violation. And I've never done it. Why? I'm not interested. But um, I have downloaded large copyright books, and I download them often. Now, this is another thing. You don't get the exemption. A lot of people's rights, which are right next to copyright, will be severely impaired. Um, last time in the demonstration, I'm not going to do it. Or take a moment to pull it out. I have a little, a little so-called USB memory stick. And last time I stuck it in a different computer and it booted the operating system. You couldn't see it. If this exemption isn't granted, Microsoft has formally declared they will do their best to stop that from happening on any computer with an ARM chip that they have a deal. And they're going to get a deal with almost all the manufacturers. That will never happen. In other words, I have to keep a copyrighted work, which is worth something. I may not pay for it because the guy freely licensed it. Other ones similar to it, you pay. This thing, does it contain an OS? Previous date. This little thing contains a copyrighted, very good operating system, a variant of which, by the way, unless you modify the internals of circuit, <laughs> you're running a variant of this operating system, which is free. The upper layers are under restrictive copyright license, and Apple claims it'll make be very annoyed and make a lot of noise. Apple, by the way, is strongly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Apple's strongly against all these exemptions. I think I spoke to an Apple representative earlier. Um, but Apple's been very kind. People violate. They violate on a massive scale today the anti-circumvention, the prohibition on, on uh, circumvention of, I've forgotten the full technical name, the, the DRM stuff. Um, Apple makes no attempt to actually lock down their devices. No serious attempt. It's usually within 24 hours. I've heard there's even a website you can go to, the most recent <coughs> iPhones. And you go to the website using your iPad, and you press a big red button. And after a couple of minutes, if you're the connection to the next bit, it says, congratulations, root. And you've got root on the device. That's to say you own it. And when, when we say that, that we don't own the iPad until you get root, let's be very clear. Kindle, and it's as if our propaganda team, maybe maybe they did. Um, Kindle, some years ago, got confused about the copyright status of the book, 1984, by George Orwell. 
And so people who bought it from the Kindle store for probably a dollar, it may even go one of the freebies, I don't know. They went to the people's Kindles. This is very hard to believe because, of course, there are laws in the United States against somebody invading your computer and destroying some of your files. You go to jail if you're convicted for that. They went in to the Kindle of I don't know how many thousand people, and they destroyed that file. Later on, they said they got confused about the copyright things. But what it shows is what Amazon thinks. And Amazon thinks, correct, that they own every Kindle until it's been jailbroken. Jailbroken, practically, they don't anymore. Um, as for Android, um, Google owns everyone that walks out of the store. But Google says that on the Chromebooks, they won't cooperate with any vendor unless they make it possible by flicking, actually, if you flip two switches in a row. I've actually seen a Samsung Chromebook. There are two switches. Once you flick them, you own it. Now, certain services will not be available to you, right, once you've uh, put on your own operators. We have zero problem with that. That, of course, they're offering a service that happens to be over the net. Um, they uh, don't like the looks of the machine on the other end. I think that's pretty much within their, I think it's only within their rights to say, ah, oh, you don't get it, sorry, you don't get it. And um, the issue is not one of some small hampering or convenience. The issue is something that lies at the foundations of at least what the history books used to say, and I think some of our propaganda still says, it's that every American, if they've got the money, can buy something and use it as long as they don't injure other people or violate certain rules, like the FCC has rules of this thing, right? I don't recommend changing the hardware so that I can say suppress all your um, all your all your telephones in the room. I'm utterly against that because that's an interference with other people's stuff. Um, but your time's up. I'm very sorry. Let's give you two minutes to wrap up. The issue isn't a small issue. It's not an issue. Um, and the people have spoken, by the way. Uh, people want control over their device. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jesse. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Jesse Fader, uh, Director of International Trade and Intellectual Property for the Business Software Alliance. Um, and I'm here to speak in opposition to classes on transport. Uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of statistics, and then I will spare the statistics for the remainder of my statement. Um, there are over 100 million smartphone users in the U.S. today. There are tens of millions of tablet users. Well over a million apps are available from thousands of individual software developers to the four top mobile software platforms. Android, iOS, RIM, and Windows Phone. And literally tens of billions of apps have been downloaded. Fierce competition exists among the major software platforms and the multitude of apps that run on them. The range of choices available to consumers is truly mind-boggling. It's against this background of a dynamic, competitive marketplace that the office must decide whether to grant an exemption under Section 1201, an exemption that's being sought in the name of consumer choice and competition. Our view is that granting an exemption will be justified by neither the statute nor public policy. In point of fact, the PPMs at issue play a key role in motivating investment into these platforms and the apps that run on them. I'll begin by discussing Class 5, since many of the arguments against that class also to the much broader proposal for Class 4. I'll then discuss the additional reasons why we oppose the proposed Class 4 exemption. The proponents of Class 5 have not met their burden of demonstrating a substantial adverse impact on their ability to make non-infringing uses of a particular class of copyrighted works. The Class 5 proponents allege that there is a substantial class of consumers who are harmed by their inability to install lawful unapproved apps on the mobile device of their choice. To be certain, there are some users who install or wish to install only legitimate apps that are not available through the curated distribution model employed by some platforms. 
but there was no evidence that this was a significant improvement. For example, EFF has proffered statistics about the number of phones that have been jailbroken and the number of installations of Cydia. But these statistics, in and of themselves, do not establish that a large number of users are jailbreaking their devices solely to install legitimate apps. Jailbreaking is a precondition for installing pirated software. And Cydia distributes pirated apps as well as legitimate ones. So many of the users counted in these statistics are engaged in piracy. <clears throat> Even if the proponents could demonstrate a substantial adverse impact, they have failed to show that the harm they allege is not outweighed by the positive effects of the use of PPNs on the availability of copyrighted works. Access controls are central to a distribution system that benefits consumers, independent app developers, and third-party content creators, as well as developers of mobile operating systems. They are at the heart of a curated model of software distribution that gives consumers a level of assurance regarding quality and security, and gives app developers and content creators a level of assurance regarding anti-piracy. The end result is a staggering number of apps that have been developed by thousands of independent developers and distributed to the public. Consumers have a vast array of choices, including hundreds of thousands of apps that are available for free. They also have the option of foregoing the curated model by choosing a platform like Android or Linux that is much more open. TPMs on mobile devices have led to widespread availability of works. In short, they are precisely the kind of use facilitating technological protection measures that Congress sought to promote in enacting Section 1201. The flip side of that proposition <clears throat> is that permitting the disabling of these locks increases the value of copyrighted works by undermining the value proposition that the platform creator offers to users and independent developers. A big factor in what makes a platform attractive to consumers is the availability and quality of applications that run on the platform. If a platform becomes less attractive to application developers or if customers lose confidence in the quality or security of the apps available to run on it, they will be less likely to choose it, thus reducing the value of the platform and the software that runs it. For their part, app developers who experience high levels of piracy on a particular platform see the value of their works decline as they lose the ability to monetize them. There is plenty of discussion in the developer community about how higher rates of piracy on the Android platform, for example, is driving them to alternatives like the iPhone. Moreover, unauthorized reproduction and modification of an operating system for the purpose of running non-approved applications is not a non-infringing use because it is not fair use. In our view, the fair use argument for jailbreaking relies on an inappropriate extension of two Ninth Circuit cases on reverse engineering, Sega versus Accolade and Sony v. Connectix. Sega and Sony are cases involving intermediate copying and the development of an end product that is not substantially similar to the original computer program. When the owner of a device jailbreaks it, he creates and uses a substantially similar, in fact, substantially identical version of the operating system. In the reverse engineering cases, the use of the original program was viewed as indirect. Here we're talking about a direct, more or less continuous use of the modified version of the program for the same purposes as the original. Jailbreaking is not transformative, as the Supreme Court used the term in the approach. It does not add something new with further purpose or different character. The hacked operating system is of the same character and serves the same purpose as the original operating system. Very little new or additional expression is added, only what is necessary for a TPM. Finally, I'd like to take a few moments to clarify our view on Section 1201F before I discuss Proposed Class 4. In Section 1201F, Congress created a narrow exception for non-infringing reverse engineering that contains a number of important safeguards. Jailbreaking would not qualify. First, the exception is for development of interoperable software. 
Jailbreaking by consumers is not for the purpose of developing a software. Second, since the customer who jailbreaks a mobile device generally does so in violation of the license terms of the operating system, there is no longer a lawful right to use the software as required by the statute. Third, the information needed to make applications interoperable with a mobile device is readily available to app developers. Platform developers make software development kits available to app developers to help and encourage them to develop apps to run on their platforms. We do believe, however, that Section 1201F is relevant to this proceeding as an expression of congressional intent. Congress has stated that while achieving interoperability is a valid basis for an exception in some circumstances, those circumstances are narrow. The fact that Congress has created a specific exception under Section 1201F and that the proposed class would not qualify for it should weigh against granting an exception under Section 1201A1. Regarding proposed class 4, it is far broader than proposed class 5, covering all personal computing devices. We believe that the reasons just stated for rejecting the narrower class 5 apply here as well. In addition, we know that the argument for exempting personal computers relies on speculation about how a specification, UEF by 2.3.1, will be implemented sometime in the future. There is no current impairment of non-infringing uses that the proponents of class 4 can point to, and their speculation is insufficient to establish the likelihood that there will be an impairment of non-infringing uses in the next few years. As uh, the House Manager's report stated, the evidence of the likelihood of future adverse impact during the time period has to be highly specific, strong, and persuasive, and that is simply not the case here. The proponents have simply not been to agree. I would just like to uh, respond to a couple of things that, uh, that were said um, before I uh, turn to my colleague here. Um, one is that there was a great deal of talk of right of ownership. Um, I, I think to the extent that that's at all relevant in this, in this proceeding, and I'm really not at all certain that it is, uh, I, I think we have to bear in mind that the kinds of transactions that we're talking about here are transactions that involve sale of hardware, but also licensing of software and content, and other ongoing relationships, both between the consumer and the uh, software developer that is providing uh, updates on, uh, for, the, uh, for the software that's embedded in the device, and also with the, uh, the carrier, if this is a device that works on, on a uh, telecommunications network. So we're talking about something far more complex than the sale of a book that you put on your shelf. We're talking about ongoing contractual relationships here that govern much of what um, the proponents of the exemptions would like to argue are is simply inherent to the right of ownership of the device that you buy. And with that, let me turn to uh, Steve. Before you go, I just wanted to uh, let people put on notice because I have questions about what you just said. So just think about it. It's about the UEFI. I'm very interested in that, what Windows 8 does. So rather than ask questions when you're done, just think about that as you go forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Metallics, here representing seven national groups of copyright owners and creators. Uh, I'll be very brief, I, uh, since I did have the opportunity to, uh, to speak on this uh, at the hearing on May 17th with regard to uh, proposal number five. Uh, the only thing I'd like to say about that is uh, that on May 31st, in, in the hearing on May 17th, it was pointed out that much of the information we've provided about the relationship between uh, hacking of the uh, smartphone operating systems and uh, firmware and uh, piracy was rather outdated, and so uh, we were asked if we had any more up-to-date information. We do. We've submitted it to you. We've got the, our, our uh, the, the proponents, um, and uh, I've got a couple of copies here if people are interested. But basically, uh, I think this material makes a couple of points that Jesse has already summarized. One is that there is a link between jailbreaking, as it's called, and uh, uh, pirate capital. 
applications. Uh, indeed, the leading app store uh, for providing jailbreaking tools uh, also provides many pirate applications, uh, and I think that's documented in these, uh, in these materials. I think the other point that's, uh, that's important here is, and again, Jesse's referred to this, is that uh, while there certainly are competitive models here, uh, and you can, you can compare the Apple model and the Android model in terms of the, uh, uh, the degree to which uh, unrestricted uh, applications are, are available in an unrestricted manner in the latter uh, more than the former. Um, and the marketplace obviously is going to decide which uh, of those uh, models prevail or whether they will continue to coexist as they do now. But one uh, difference between those two models, which is spelled out in many of these articles, is that the Apple model does encourage and, and support greater development and dissemination of new, app, new apps. Uh, there's far more apps available uh, on the Apple model than the Android model, even though Android actually is far more prevalent in the marketplace. So the, the potential market is larger, but developers are not as eager to exploit that because that, and that, that Android marketplace is characterized by very high levels uh, of piracy. So, uh, again, this is in the, these articles that talk about if app piracy worsens, developers will return to iOS or even switch to Windows Phone 7. Both are more secure than Android. So, uh, in terms of the, the dichotomy that the office drew in this 2010 record, between business interests and copyright interests. Uh, I, I, we've already indicated that we hope the office will revisit that. We don't see the basis for that in the statute. But in fact, here is a case where uh, it's clear that the interests that, that, that uh, underlie the model, uh, the Apple model, for example, in contrast to the Android model, include promotion of uh, the development and dissemination of copyright works. So the business interest is a copyright one that is directly relevant to one of the criteria Congress asked you to apply, which is the effect on the availability of copyrighted works. Um, I'll just say with regard to number four, and I'm sure we'll have some, some questions about it, um, uh, I think it's, in some sense, you know, we heard from the previous uh, witnesses that you can't really draw a sharp line between uh, a tablet and a, and a Computer, personal computer, three, four, and five. I think part of this is perhaps the fallout of the failure of the proponents of uh, Exemption 5 to provide any definition of the tablet. And, and I think it would be a very unwise move to recognize any uh, uh, exemption in that area unless there's a clear definition so that people will be able to know what the exemption covers and what it, what it doesn't cover. Um, the, the, I think, again, if, if you look at the marketplace as it exists now, it is a highly competitive marketplace, as Jesse indicated. Um, and uh, uh, if, if, if you were looking for a place where you have an unrestricted ability to install any application you want, that, that uh, uh, option is clearly available in the, in the personal computer marketplace. Uh, and we indicate that there's, there's some speculation that it might not be as available in the future, but and that's the word that the proponents use. Uh, it really doesn't amount to more than speculation, and as Jesse has indicated, that falls far short of the standard you've been asked to apply. And even in the, you know, the, the issue of, of uh, re installing a new operating system, I, I'm not, not going to take it as a given that that actually involves circumvention of, of the access controls on the existing operating system, but even if it does, uh, commodity uh, hardware in the PC space is available. I think in the, in the, the software uh, Freedom Law Center submission, they say it's, well, it's not available in the, uh, uh, in the, the mobile phone space, um, but it, it, is, it is certainly available in the, uh, uh, in the PC space. So, so in other words, you, you have, users have access if they want to a, a, a computer that, on which they can install their own operating system. So the options are available, circumvention is to do, to do that, and there's really, uh, the, the, the proponents haven't been able, I, I think, to uh, carry the burden of showing that, that uh, exemption is, meets the statutory standards uh, in, with regard to the uh, So I, I will stop there and I'd be glad to answer any questions. <coughs> Thank you.
can you hear me okay? Can I speak at this level? Um, a little bit louder? Okay. Thank you for having me back again today. I am excited to be back again speaking with you about these issues because I think they're very important. Uh, I'm Marsha Hoffman. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. My organization is the proponent for pr proposed class five. I have four points in response to Mr. Fader. First of all, consumers will suffer an adverse impact if Exemption 5 isn't granted. Um, for three years now, people have been benefiting from the 2010 exemption that was granted that allowed the jailbreaking of smartphones. And since then, uh, tablets and other mobile devices have been introduced to the market. Um, for the past three years, um, there's been tremendous growth, uh, not only in the market, as everybody agrees, but in the practice of jailbreaking and in the development of independently designed but unapproved third-party applications for use on those devices. If this exemption isn't granted, then the people who have been making uh, legitimate lawful uses of this type of software on their iPhones for the past three years are all going to become criminals. Their behavior is going to become illegal. And people who are doing similar things or would like to do similar things with tablets uh, are going to be chilled in their ability to do so. And there's simply no reason for that. And I think it's worth noting, by the way, that uh, the anti-circumvention provisions of the DNCA do carry criminal penalties. I mean, this is not just a, a situation where people need to be worried about being sued for jailbreaking their phones so that they can uh, you know, configure a custom interface that they like better than the one that, that Apple provided, but they actually have to think about the fact that there are criminal penalties. In theory, they could go to jail. Would anybody ever prosecute them? Probably not. But it's something that they have to think about. And that kind of a legal cloud does not encourage innovation and it doesn't encourage consumer choice. And it doesn't encourage competition. So I encourage you to think about that. Number two, Exemption 5 is a narrowly crafted exemption that is not going to legalize piracy. I, I want to be incredibly clear about this, particularly in light of the uh, article submis submitted by Mr. Metallitz on Friday and one submitted by Mr. Fader yesterday. These are all uh, articles that express concern about piracy. I think that they are completely, um, uh, they have nothing to do with our exemption request. Our exemption request is about uh, making lawful uses of uh, third party software and piracy simply doesn't fit into that equation. Um, as the uh, evidence submitted by Mr. Metallitz in his um, opening comments showed, piracy was an issue uh, back before the 2010 exemption was granted, and we can see that it is still an issue today. Um, and I think that that's you know, something that nobody disputes. Uh, if this exemption is granted, what it will do is clear the way for people to make lawful, fair uses of software on their, on their devices. Um, it won't clear the way for piracy, it won't remove any um, existing legal remedies that copyright holders have uh, when um, users are infringing content or pirating apps or installing pirated apps. Um, all it will do is clear the way for lawful uses, and that's it. And so, you know, to the extent that piracy may continue, um, you know, basically if this exemption isn't granted, then all jailbreaking is going to be illegal. Uh, but if it is granted, then people will actually be able to make lawful uses. So I think that that is important to recognize. Um, third, we heard some testimony about the vast array of apps that are available. Um, I think that that would be a much smaller array of apps uh, if it weren't for the fact that developers are able to develop for, for platforms like the iPhone um, if they can't get their apps approved by Apple and uh, distribute those applications through other alternative uh, markets. And so, um, I think that jailbreaking does nothing but encourage development and encourage competition and encourage innovation. And, um, you know, if developers decide that they don't like developing for the Android platform, for instance, uh, because piracy is a big issue there or for whatever other reason, they can choose to develop for some other platform and jailbreaking opens the way for them to be able to do that. Um, just briefly, 1201F, um, I mean, I think we've talked about this at length at the last hearing. Um, it is true that Congress granted a uh, reverse engineering exception in 1201. Um, I don't think Congress could have foreseen what we're looking at today. And that's what this rulemaking process exists for. So that you can actually grant exemptions when Congress perhaps couldn't have foreseen what was going on. Now, I would appreciate the opportunity to um, respond to the uh, article submitted by Mr. Metallitz and Mr. Gator in writing. But um, 
I you know, just want to say, really, I think that they are beside the point because they have to do with piracy. And I just want to reiterate, this proposed exemption has nothing to do with piracy. It wouldn't legitimize piracy. It wouldn't legalize piracy. It would legalize lawful fair uses. And that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, um, I, one, one more thing. I know you had questions for me uh, at the last hearing, and one of them was, as Mr. Mattel had said, what is a tablet? And that is not something that responds to Mr. Fader, so I'm not going to address that now, but if you have any questions that you would like to bring up with me here that I can answer, I would be happy to address those things. I'm prepared to do that. Thank you. Okay, before we go to questions, do any of the other proponents have anything to say in direct response to what was said? And I said this each time, it really is in direct response to what was said, not just something else you want to say. No, it's it's very direct. direct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fader stated that the harm of keeping law as it is today, namely the anti-circumvention uh, or technical <coughs> laws that the DMCA enforce, is, you know, that the harms are speculative. Oh, yeah. As of last week, um, Microsoft has attained to a lock now defended by the DMCA upon most computers sold, all Dell all HP computers, all Lenovo computers, from this day forward, will not allow you to install a different operating system. Now, I think Mr. Metallic's pointed out that there's a difference between diddling with iOS and installing a different operating system. I want to emphasize, I agree there's a difference. And the more important issue is, I think you should be able to diddle with it. Um, but, but that's a small issue for me. The big issue is the absolute lockout of other operating systems on the ARM, that is the formal, strict, openly declared, repeatedly position of Microsoft. If they make a deal with a vendor and it's an ARM device, they're going to do their darndest, backed by the present law and criminal penalties, to stop me if I buy some <coughs> I'm sorry, I'll be slow. I'm sorry, I didn't see that you were using the wonderful multi-strike <laughs> st steno device. Um, if, uh, if you buy an ARM device next year, and the deal's been made with by Microsoft, and I don't know if Microsoft would take you to court, they're intelligent about that, unlike Sony. Sony, I think, has tried to start to induce criminal proceedings against GeoHot, but I'm not sure it was resolved before, but within court. And it's from, it was a civil case. Yeah. It was a civil case. Yeah. Okay, I stand corrected. Um, okay, so it's not speculative because of the long history of domination by Microsoft with the major sellers of home computers. They've been able now to get to a position where it's not just that you know when, when the stuff comes there you can throw away the thing. You know they'll never give you a refund. Although that's in the law, they're required to. They won't do it. Now, when I go to install with that little thing, the free BSD thing, today on this machine, I put it in, I boot it, a new operating system is running. If I want to install it, there's an install script maybe on that thing, or I have to use another. It doesn't make a difference. I can put whatever OS I want on this machine. There's no electromechanical crypto bar to it, and certainly no electromechanical crypto bar backed by criminal penalties if I do it and then publicize how to do it. The issue is the right of private ownership of computer hardware. It's nothing else. And let me just say, and this is more than pro forma in my case, I don't in any way approve of people massively committing copyright violations via, I don't even know the names of these stupid programs they use. It has nothing to do with it. The issue is whether in practice, given the present business situation, whether next year I can buy this machine and put an operating system of my choice on it, which again, I repeat, I'm not boasting, it's just a fact. Of course I'm boasting. I never ever violated anybody's copyrights, although I put a lot of copyrighted material on here, several different operating systems, all of them free. And, and the competition, I just want to close with one thing. It's all an answer to the two things. If, if, say, in 1985, and it could have happened in 1985, we had the techniques, the UEFI, or Palladium, as the important one, the T 
keeping them. It has many names. We got them to change the name in 2003 because it made it stink in the nostrils of people who knew about computers. If that had been enforced, then when Apple was going bust in the 90s and trying to build an operating system, they seemingly didn't have the resources to do. They had the resources. They didn't have the intelligence to hire people who could build an operating system. And they brought Steve Jobs back. He said, I'll sell you my little operating system. It's a free operating system. It's the one that ran next. It's once again a free BSD. It's a complicated thing. The lower level is something called mock. Top level is free BSD. And, and I just want a free Apple system without all the Apple stuff on top. OK, if, I, if that isn't a serious impairment of competition, I'm sorry, please forgive me for going. One more thing. Competition in which arena? And QE Bono. The people who really benefit from this is not the end user who likes to watch movies on their device. I know that's their theory. And I might even say it's partly true. But the people who really benefit, who really rake in the dollars, it's Apple. And Microsoft hopes it'll be in that position. And Sony. And so you have to ask yourself, what are we? Now, you have to be precise. I'll just say one more. The precise thing is, I won't be able to boot. I won't be able to go to the store, spend five hundred or a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, get this nice laptop, and then boot the operating system, the only one that I run. I won't be able to do it. It'll cost me a lot more. It'll probably be available for a few more years. They'll work to extinguish that. That's the issue. Not confident. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I will give you an opportunity, but I want to make sure I understand the point you made about Microsoft. Is it that Microsoft has, A, I gather it's made some deals with some equipment manufacturers yeah. as part of it. Yes. And as part of those deals, the new Windows operating system will be installed on their computers yeah. with access controls that prevent one from taking it off? Is that the notion? Or am I, am um, I, I don't know. You may be able to destroy it. I'm not uh -huh. sure. But you certainly will not be able to install um, a new operating system. And this one's got an operating system that I installed by making a, I forgot if I made a CD or a little thumb drive. And the way it works is you have to go into the BIOS. When it starts up, there's a little button you press, and you come to the BIOS, and it's somewhat mysterious. And the last time I pointed out, when I bought a different machine, I brought a different machine than they had bought it the day before, it had a password on it. Now, if you don't put the password in on the machine that I showed before, you're going to have a hard time. You might be able to crack into it, but you know, that's not my interest. I bought a machine for 200 bucks. I think it was and I wanted to run that day my own operating system. I needed another machine for some purpose. So I called the guy up. He gave me the password. He left the rest of me gave me the password. I put it in. But it's the equivalent of that password. But it's, it's a much better system. The BIOS and that thing, if I didn't know the password, I actually know how to get around it. It's not a big deal. It would take me a day or so. Right? I'd have to pull out the battery. Get the stupid, uninteresting thing. I can get on home. But the new things are such that um, either you have to go to Microsoft and beg them to sign the so-called kernel of the operating system. Now, as a matter of fact, in the past week, a distribution of GNU Linux called Fedora, it's the so-called free version of Red Hat, um, they decided to pay $99, not directly to Microsoft, an indirect payment, a one-time fee, and they would sign a certain number of their kernels and then it would boot. Okay? In the future, any whole operating system author, and all operating systems are under copyright, just about all today. I, I think very few are in the public domain. They're all huge copyrighted works with literally hundreds of thousands at a minimum man hours of work by highly skilled people. They're creative. The ones I'm interested in are freely licensed. Okay, so you don't pay money. If you want it, by the way, some of the freely licensed ones you have to pay money for. That's, that's not an issue of money. But, but the licensing is such that I get to freely modify them. And in some cases, I can redistribute binaries of the modified ones. In other cases, when I redistribute the binaries, I'm required by the terms of the copyright license to offer a copy of the source. OK, let's, let's leave that aside. This is, if this exemption number four is not granted, it will almost surely end the, the, the uh, I hesitate to use the word market, the distribution of valuable copyrighted works. As I 
I said, if in 1985 the system had been put in, you might be running an Apple, and they might be as rich as they are today. When it came to it, I don't believe this number, but people are getting quoted, so I'll cut it in half. They spent 500 million. The quote is, is 1 billion, and it's repeated and quoted by people who look at the numbers. I don't believe it's impossible. But even 500 million is possible. They spent 500 million and got nothing. They wanted to build a so called proprietary or source secret operating system. And I actually learned something about it privately. Thank you. I've come to the end of my, I've come to the end of my time, if I'm reminded by that. If I can have the opportunity to, to make my response to their particular well, You can, moment, but I just, I just want to follow up on what he said. Okay. I'll get back there, wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be any Apple, at least in the form we know it today. Okay. If this had been enforced, All right. I'd like to get Jesse and Dad or Steve to react and just back to sure. Sure. Jay's account of the New Deal Apple is made apparently with some equipment manufacturer. Uh, so my Microsoft. 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 Microsoft.
whether circumvention should be allowed to the user or anything like that. But we said this is a signal that, that these measures are moving to the personal computing part. Since our initial filing, uh, Microsoft published a new specification for Windows certification. Uh, that specification divides personal computers into two categories, those that are based on the Intel architecture and those that are based on the ARM architecture. For the Intel architecture, the specification states that computers that implement UEFI, or all computers must implement UEFI and UEFI security boot, um, but the uh, physically present user must be able to install new operating system keys into the UEFI firmware, thus allowing them to install the operating system of their choice. That's for the Intel too? That's for the Intel architecture. For ARM, the specification states that um, they must implement UEFI secure boot. Secure boot must be enabled. <coughs> Only operating systems whose keys already exist in that firmware at the time of purchase or later updated by Microsoft and its partners will be able to uh, be installed on the computer. Okay, thanks. And Brett, Brett you had wanted to speak with me. Yeah, um, my UF, UEFI comments I'm going to uh, leave aside because Aaron stated them uh, quite properly. Uh, I will say. Uh, that what the other side has said about, well, all this talk of UFDI is pure speculation. It hasn't come to be. It hasn't come to be. Uh, it is my belief, and that's all it is, my belief, my personal opinion, that the reason the UEFI stuff has not been written in stone by Microsoft and the rest of the globulators is because they are intentionally waiting until after these hearings and until after the ruling is made because then they will gain a significant business advantage if the American <clears throat> citizen is enjoined from being able to make use of his tools the way he wishes to. Uh, the other side also said that uh, the only reason for jailbreak breaking one of these devices was for piracy. Well, that's entirely wrong. There are people, such as myself, that are fed up with our cell phone carriers shoving crap down to our phones. Uh, my particular phone has at least four applications on it that did not come on it when I bought it, that I did not install, that have been shoved down by Sprint in the year and a half I've owned the phone. And they're constantly between them and Google shoving applications down to the phone in the form of updates that I don't particularly want. Thus, forcing me to continuously uninstall stuff when I can uninstall it. But some things don't even show up in the uninstaller that is available to the owner of the device. Um, this, the, the lack of exemptions would definitely stifle the, the, the free market. Uh, as Jay has pointed out, the, the ability to boot the operating system of your choice on any computing device, if you physically own that hardware, you should be able to put whatever software on it you want that you have a legal right to use. And the way UEFI is spec to work, the way many of the smaller more mobile devices work today, it is very difficult for the ordinary person to make that choice, even if they want to. When my father was still alive, he asked me at one point to set him up a personal computer at home. My father had been an electronic technician in the Navy for 30 years. Uh, his job was mainly maintaining computers. He thought he could maintain a computer. I gave him a Windows computer because my mother insisted on it because that's what the neighbors had. I advised against it, but that's what he got. Uh, after a few months, he said to me, well, this is happening, that's happening. How do I fix this? How do I fix that? Well, I'm sorry, Dad, you can't get it inside. Uh, a few months later, I replaced it with a completely different operating system, something called FreeBSD. And my dad was in hog heaven until he died 
because he could actually fix things when they went wrong. He could tinker with things. Uh, he could essentially be the backyard tinkerer that has brought us so many innovations in this country. Without these exemptions, you're getting rid of the backyard tinkerer. Today's backyard tinkerer tinkers with his computer as opposed to, say, steam-powered machinery, or pumps, or internal combustion engines. Although, albeit there are still some people that tinker with those and try to come up with improvements. But by and large, the majority of tinkerers, the majority of individual makers in this country, make things using what is essentially the universal machine. This is the machine that I can give instructions to to do anything. Today, that will not be the case if these exemptions are not granted, especially if the inlogulators get things like UEFI locked in. Through. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Jesse made the point that the operating system for mobile devices is the right one, and I, I'd like to counter that point. I think that it's better characterized essentially now as we have uh, a, you know, roughly, we have, we have roughly equal market share between Android and uh, iOS on, on smartphones, for example. Um, the remaining, say, 10% of the market uh, is shared by uh, a rapidly declining rim uh, who makes BlackBerry devices and the Windows phone whose future is uncertain at this point. Um, rim who uh, chopped, I think, some 400 jobs last week or last month um, is, I think, most of would say, not necessarily long for this world in at least its present form. Um, Pong is also uh, a, a recent um, uh, a recent loss in the in the uh, in this market. Um, so now we've gone from from four relatively strong players to perhaps two. So the idea that the competition is thriving here, I think, is is incorrect. And uh, I think that Mozilla um, is sort of one of the few uh, few potential players who has who have a real credible shot at, at entering this market. This as I said, uh, they've been relying on the exemption granted in, in 2010 in order to in order to make an entry into the market. Um, uh, both of the opponents also made the point that uh, that <coughs> alternative app stores encourage piracy, saying that, that there are pirated apps in the city of app store. Uh, that may be. I, I'm not sure. I don't have evidence for that myself. Um, but my understanding is that the city's policy is against piracy just as the iOS app store's policy is against pirated apps. I've had several clients, um, free software developers, uh, who have come to me with uh, reports that their software, GPL software, was, was uh, being distributed in the app store in uh, violation of the, the new general public license and therefore an infringement of their copyrights. So piracy is not, piracy is not a, a problem that is unique to jailbroken phones or to Cydia. It's a problem that will always be with us, and, and no matter how strictly one curates an app store, uh, piracy can still be a problem. I think that uh, the, the difference in piracy that you see on Android versus iOS is not necessarily due, as uh, the opponents have said, to the more open nature of Android, um, to the sideloading of applications, but rather to its uh, rather lackadaisical approach to the, the curation of apps. Um, you have less review of the applications that are going into the app store, and then uh, sort of by definition, you're going to miss more piracy. Uh, but that has nothing to do with whether a user is able to jailbreak a phone and install an operating system. Um, the, the statistics as to the success of the app store, I'm, I'm happy to hear, because I think that it vindicates the, uh, your decision in, in 2009 proceedings to grant the exemption for smartphones. The fact that the uh, success of the applications have uh, continued to grow uninterrupted since that time, as I said in my initial comments, uh, I think demonstrates the, the wisdom of that, of that exemption. 
Um, as I said, regarding UAFI, at this point, there's, there, it, it's not speculative what's going to happen with UAFI. Microsoft has definite policies, and we now have uh, new devices, laptop computers that are being produced on ARM, Windows certified, that you'll be unable to install alternative operating systems on unless Microsoft has approved a key for that operating system, usually in collaboration with a vendor. And of course, uh, for, for my clients, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not adequate uh, that, that you'd be able to um, make a deal with a particular licensing authority to get a key into uh, computers because, um, for example, uh, one of my clients, uh, Gentoo, Linux-based operating system with hundreds of thousands of users is built from source every time, uh, which means that the whatever you know, whatever image you apply a key to will be different from the image that a later user will actually install on a computer, and therefore uh, a, a key-based system corresponding to a, a particular operating system image can never work for an operating system like that. Um, and I. You know, as my final comment uh, at this stage, I'd like to point out that the statutory standard is not that circumvention be absolutely necessary to make the use, uh, the fair use, or the non-infringing use at issue, um, but that users of copyrighted works are ad adversely affected. And I, I think that uh, the opponents have re repeatedly tried to uh, elevate the statutory standard so that, um, you know, that if there is any uh, way any sort of answer um, to a problem that it, it's no longer a problem. I don't think that's the case. I think that as long as as long as users have, as long as we've demonstrated that users are adversely affected by the prohibition, then um, then I think that you are well within your right to grant an exemption. Uh, any responses to what was what's been said since you two last spoke? Cool. Um, let me first start with the standard. Um, language in legislative history is substantial adverse effect. So we're talking about something more than a, an adverse effect that affects a few people, a few diehard people who want to tinker with the dust on their computer. We're talking about something that is significant in the context of the marketplace that we're talking about. And we're talking about a marketplace of millions and millions of phones, millions and millions of other so I, I, I think the fact that marketplace alternatives do exist, we've demonstrated that they exist, um, really puts a heavy burden on opponents to establish that this is more than just an adverse effect on a few people. Can I ask, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, what, so what is the threshold then in terms of when do you get to that point when it becomes an adverse effect? Is it 100,000, a million, five million? That seems to be a. Um, I, think it's going to, I think it's going to depend on the marketplace you're talking about. In, in this particular instance, you're talking about a marketplace of hundreds of millions of devices. So I think you have the, 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 the threshold is correspondingly higher. I can't get that precise number. Um, I think the question of piracy um, is very relevant. Um, jailbreaking enables the installation of pirate maps. I don't think anybody here would dispute that that is the case. Regardless of how you wrong the, uh, the, the class that's being proposed, on day one, you may jailbreak the phone for the purposes set forth in that class. And it's a perfectly legal um, perfectly legal act if it falls within the, the exception. On day two, the phone is still jailbroken, and it still enables the installation of pirated apps and on day three and day four and so forth. So we need to be cognizant of what the effect is, even if the intention is only to permit certain kinds of installations on jailbroken phones. Once you throw the doors wide open, pirate stuff is going to find its way into these devices. We know that it does. 
But isn't, isn't the case that you, I would have, if I'm an honest citizen, and I'd be able to phone, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to download pirated apps. There's some sort of, for me at least, there's a disconnect. There's, there is the possibility that it may happen, but it doesn't mean I'm going to take action. Just like I can drive a car, I avoid everyone on the road, I could hit that person on the curb, but I don't. So isn't that the same? And don't you want to trust the people who do this for the right <coughs> purposes? Yeah, again, you have to look at the nature of the marketplace. And the fact is that a lot of people are jailbreaking their phones in the belief that it's perfectly legal and they're doing it for the purpose. Maybe initially, maybe the purpose develops later on once they finally can install pirate apps, but they are installing pirate apps on their phones. There is a, a definite connection between, a definite causal connection between jailbreaking a phone and the installation of pirate content on that phone. But, and, and this is a, a key point in Steve Lee to four. The copyright interest doesn't begin with the piracy. There is more at stake here. What we are talking about is, is what is the economic model to sustain creativity. And we no longer live in a world where the, the, the sole or even the dominant model is sales of copies for a particular price. In the case of these kinds of devices, we're talking about business models. And it's not a dirty word in this context. We're talking about business models where there are different income streams flowing to different people, including the copyright owner of the operating system. You don't sell, as a general matter, you don't sell copies, individual copies, divorced of the rest of this transaction of the operating system. But that doesn't mean the operating system has any value. It doesn't mean that this is being done as a charitable endeavor. It's part of a business endeavor, part of a business model that sustains the creative process. And it, it, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about what's the distinction between, uh, say, a Kindle and an iPad. And I think there is a meaningful distinction to be made there. But it's not a meaningful distinction based on technology. It's a meaningful distinction based on the underlying business model. The Kindle is sold at a lower cost because of another expensive income stream, the sale of copyrighted books, e-books, on the device. This is all tied together. And if, if the purpose of jailbreaking the device is to permit the, uh, essentially an end run around this business model, what you're essentially saying is that it is okay to acquire this work for something other than a customary price and to benefit from, from the use of this work for other than a customary price. No, I, just, I, mean, I respect um, what you said in terms of business models and free enterprise, but at the same time, I have concerns and about user rights and competition. And I think that, don't, well, would you agree with me that we have to balance those? It's copyright interests, business interests, user interest and competition all in this bundle as we go forward to crafting an exemption? Uh, I, think I think the one thing, we're looking at a truly competitive market in, in spite of, of, of some of the allegations that we have. I mean, competition among different platforms. I mean, Android was just a blip when this process took place a couple of years ago. And it's now emerged as the top, the, the, the most widely used mobile operating system. What's going to be the case three years or six years hence? It is a competitive marketplace. And it's a, it's a hugely competitive marketplace among apps that run on these devices. So I, I don't, if, if competition is, is a concern for you, and bearing in mind, there's a whole other body of laws to deal with the competitive behavior, agree, which is not a part of this process. Mm -hmm. um, there is competition. There is a lot of competition. But doesn't the competition stop once I buy my phone? In, in essence, I pick my phone, it's an Android, but now it's mine to do what I want in terms of what it runs, what runs on it. And again, there are thousands of phones out there. I like the Android operating system, but maybe I do not want something crammed down on my phone. I can't get rid of it, so shouldn't I have that? You can't get rid of your phone or you can't no, get rid of that 
as we had heard from the witnesses here, that Sprint sometimes, I have Sprint, sometimes downloads things when you have an update. I can't get rid of I don't know the basics upon which to get extract that particular thing that they put in there that bothers me because maybe it's a new background or something. I don't have that wherewithal, but some people may well do. Shouldn't I have that right to somehow correct what I believe to be something I did not ask for? I think perhaps your 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 approach to competition is a little bit different than what Jesse is referring to because people who don't like what, how they're treated by a particular in particular business by a particular business can go to another business and they, where they're treated more to their liking. And this even extends to the very tiny, tiny minority of people who want to install uh, a home-cooked operating system on their computer. They, they have to have that ability. They will have that ability. And while I, I have no knowledge, first-hand knowledge about this Microsoft UEFI, you know, if it's as described by the proponents, they would still have that ability. So I'm not sure how uh, the burden of proving that they need to circumvent in order to make the use of a particular program that they want mm -hmm. has, has, has been met in that circumstance. May I? I'll try to be very brief. I agree with Jesse Fader and Steve Metallitz. Fundamentally, and this is my point I've been trying to make here for several of these hearings, the other side's minimum demand is absolute ownership of every personal computer on Earth because nothing else when they say business model, what they mean is from boot until you close it off at night after you watched your movies because you have a contract. It's under the control of Apple or Microsoft. I agree with what they said fundamentally. And they're now, uh, this was, I was hoping to be able to make this argument, I wasn't able to make it. They're claiming that the entire operating system must be considered to be a piece of DRM which this law, the DMCA, applies to, and you can't touch it. This is crazy. When the law was passed, the technical means were some ridiculous little piece of software that people would run Windows, and then they'd get around it, right? Now, the other side is saying they must be granted a legal power to haul somebody into court because they touch the operating system on a piece of hardware they bought. That's what they just said. I agree with them. That's what they're claiming. And that's why Exemption 4 should be granted. So when we buy a piece of hardware, you're going to have to outlaw other operating systems. Because look, for example, suppose somebody uses, I can't bring the <coughs> name of any actual operating system, and so I'll invent a new operating system called uh, Infringo. It's freely licensed. Its sole purpose is to go out on the net and infringe copyright. Now, obviously, that must be outlawed. Now, it is outlawed under today's copyright laws, OK? Certainly, its use is outlawed to infringe. They're claiming that they must be granted, in effect and in truth, um, deals will be made. It's prior restraint. And, and I'm sorry, I've been told to use that word by somebody who knows what it means. Ah, uh, it's actually on the law school. Um, okay, so, so, okay, so, um, so maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's, maybe it's fine. Maybe it's fine. As a units engineer who's got a lot of copyright work. So keep going, okay, keep going. Okay, so, so the issue is now open. The other side says the entire operating system, from the metal on up, must be under their control. Otherwise, it, you know, people can use it to, uh, to pirate stuff. Okay, that's their argument. Our argument is, I bought the hardware, and you can't twist this section of the DMCA to stop me from installing an, an operating system. Which would, that's it. I, 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 I would like to ask permission to send you, um, I hope within the month, something on the exact issue of the EFI. If Microsoft had stuck last week to what it claimed, we'd have much less objections, but they didn't. They said, uh, it was, they always claimed that once you said it before, you put it on your own key. In practice, not true as we discovered last week. That's a separate issue. But I mean, it's related. But um, OK, that's it. They made my argument. Thanks. Uh, Jesse, I think I want Jesse, to you want to respond? Yeah, I, well, I just want to respond to one, one thing that was said. We're not claiming that the entire uh, operating system is a DRM. We're saying that the operating system is copyrighted work. 
doing that. So throw away a modification of the operating system in order to eliminate the DRM as an infringement. Um, the, uh, the, I wanted to Whoa. respond to one more point that, um, I wanted to respond to one more uh, point that uh, Marsha made, which was um, a little troubling to me. It seemed to be that, and, and correct me if I'm mischaracterizing this, is that, that, that people had a reliance interest today in the uh, exemption that was granted in 2009. And given that the whole structure of this process is a, is a big over and through it for three years, that simply can't be right. I mean, that cannot be a cognizable harm that, that you look to or one would never be able to roll back an exemption once he is granted. Um, so I, I, I would strenuously object to uh, going down that route. I would like to respond to that and then also a point that was Fader made earlier. Um, I think that if we can't take that into consideration at all, then you know that would mean that the law would be completely chaotic. I mean, if this were a situation where the Copyright Office couldn't consider at all whether or not it has granted an exemption in the past, um, and you know everything were completely de novo in every way, shape, and form moving forward, um, I think we'd be in a situation where people would be in constant confusion about the state of the law. They could never rely on the legal protections they think that they have. And um, you know, I realize that the standard of review here is de novo. But I think that as a practical matter, um, it, is, it is within the Copyright Office's um, uh, discretion, and I think it makes sense, to consider whether or not it, there has been this legal protection for the three years prior, or even before that. Um, and if there you know, are good reasons not to continue granting the exemption, I, I think that, of course, that's worth taking into account as well um, when the Copyright Office is considering whether or not to renew an exemption. But I mean, the fact that you know, people for three years now have been jailbreaking their phones, um, and that that might suddenly become a completely illegal criminal act, and the effect that will have on consumers is worth taking into consideration. It may not be dispositive, but it's a factor that it's worth thinking about at the very least. Well, the first time you made that point, I wasn't certain whether you were saying what I'm about to say, but I just want to make sure. I got the impression that you were saying that if we let the exemption expire at the end of the oh, at the end of his current term, and that we don't issue a similar new exemption, those folks who have already jailbroken their phones will suddenly be in violation of Section 1201. Is that is that was that your point? No, I think moving forward they will be if they continue to jailbreak in right. the future. Yes, exactly. Okay. I mean, well, with respect to phones, I mean, my my thinking about it is that people who have jailbroken their phones during the, the current exemption period uh, have done so lawfully. But if the exemption isn't renewed, then moving forward, people who continue to do that, or people who do it for the first time, would uh, be in violation of the law. And as for tablets, there's never been an exemption. So people who do it now, in theory, um, are in violation of 1201. And moving forward, they would continue to be in violation of 1201. Of course, we've had classes that were expired in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still up here. But. Yes, it's true. The world hasn't ended. <laughs> I, I recognize that. But I do think this would affect um, this would affect millions of consumers, and I think there's plenty of evidence in the record to show that a lot of people, jailbreak devices, uh, or root devices, if we're talking about Android, and we're not talking about five people or 50 people. Um, as I mentioned during the last hearing, um, when the jailbreaking tool Absinthe was released in January, over a million devices downloaded it over a weekend. Uh, just two, two minor points. First, I'm sure if uh, the office were to decide not to issue a similar exemption to the existing jailbreak exemption, uh, I'm sure EFF would do an excellent job of informing people about the change in the legal <laughs> uh, So it would not come as a surprise. Um, the other point I, I, keep, I hear often from the right-hand side of the table here is the adjective criminal to the activity that is not covered by a 1201A1 exemption. I just wanted to get on the record that, of course, the criminal liability for 1201A1 only applies if you uh, circumvent willfully or uh, private financial personal get a pecuniary manager private financial gain. So it's, a, it, uh, it, it's not the same thing as to say it's a violation of 1201A1. So that might be for a 
example, Mozilla. I would think. I think. Well, I don't know what their, I don't know what their situation is, and there are other provisions of the statute that uh, many of the groups we've talked about here, I think, need to look at what their uh, status would be with regard to those provisions. All I'm saying is that if 1201A1 were to apply starting on October 28th to, as it does not now, to uh, the activities that are within the existing exemption, it would not mean that anyone would necessarily be in any criminal liability. Okay. Brett, you have a point? Um, yeah, just uh, going to what the other side is saying, that the effect of not getting these exemptions is limited to a few uh, a few kooks like myself who want to run what they want to run on their computers, and it would not harm the citizens at large. <clears throat> I just want to point out, I just pulled up on my very tiny computer here a website called Netcraft. What does Netcraft do? Netcraft gives statistics on what software is used by the web servers on the internet. Greater than 80% of the web servers on the internet are using free software booted, from, booted on free operating systems, which if this UEFI stuff happens, that will be the end of it. My company, Para Partners, will be stuck between a rock and a hard spot with how are we going to run websites for our customers. The websites that we design and build and host for our customers are built using an entire free software stack with the Linux operating system at the bottom or the FreeBSD operating system at the bottom, depending upon some little technical twiddly things, followed by the Apache web server, followed by the PHP language, followed by piece of software called Magento, which is also freely licensed software. All of which would not be able to boot on a computer that was restricted to booting software only approved by Microsoft. And what would the harm in that be? Well, the harm in that would be you would have, as computers aged out and became no longer fast enough were no longer able to be maintained because parts were not available, you would have large numbers of websites going off the net. Uh, you would probably also have, to a certain extent, a number of websites that would shift over to using Microsoft's inferior products for these services and pay Microsoft a large tax for that. I don't think that it is in the best interest of the American public to do something that will have that kind of an impact. And not granting these exemptions will indeed have that kind of an impact. The half-life of a production computer system is no more than three years. OK. Uh, we're rapidly running out of time, but we haven't really even got to our questions. So I'm going to ask that. Uh, Ben's going to have some questions, listen to them carefully, only respond if you've really got something to say in response to them, and try to be succinct, because if a question is being asked, it's because we're curious about something that may make a difference, and the more time you take in going off point, the less likely we are to get your answer that you really want us to hear. So, Ben. Thank you. Um, directed to Adam, um, in response to what Jesse and Steve have said about the scope of your exemption, I too have found it a little bit difficult to wrap my mind. Not exactly sure. It seems rather broad, even though you said it, it's limited. Um, is it solely, or I should say, substantially directed at operating systems, or is there a larger component to that? Because you use the term no, yes. software rather than operating systems. So I'm just trying to figure out what the scope of this is. Uh, uh, so you can certainly a right here. It's a little behind Steve. Yeah, sort of Matt. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that, however, it's, it's important to recognize that there are 
She was just going to set this one up just so she can find it. Yeah, just a regular duty. Okay. Um, we've seen it particularly with users of smartphones and tablets. It's important for many users to be able to get access to applications that are not uh, available through the official channels on their devices. Uh, it's not important to them to, to replace operating systems. And so, you know, I, I think just it's opening important it up. to take those users into account when crafting an exception. But uh, if, if you have the ability to replace the operating system, then you'll just have the ability applications as well. It's just a, a technically more difficult step and I wouldn't want to leave those users out of the cold. That is, an, that is an EFS um, except request about apps. Isn't that more to their concerns that they addressed? Um, or, or not? I'm just trying to figure well, out. As I understand EFS exemptions, they apply to operating systems and applications as well. <coughs> okay. That's all up on that. It, my understanding was that uh, I think Steve was carefully said that uh, installing a new operating system might not be, may not be circumvention. Yeah, um, I mean, this issue has come up before in a different context in this proceeding. I mean, the question is whether you need to circumvent in order to delete something and install something else. I don't know. I mean, it's a factual question. I don't know the answer to it. I think it's, the burden is on the proponents what they want to do requires certain measures, but otherwise they don't so Jeff, if you have any thoughts on that in terms of this, if you took all of the software, how can I advise? So part of the point was that I buy this device, this machine, and I want to, I own that machine. And there often isn't any licensing terms on the machine itself. The licensing is with respect to the software. Can you, uh, well, I guess the first question is, can you completely wipe it if it's their firmware or, or other things that might not be able to be completely uninstalled or um, on the machine? And if you can, is there any copyright issue, any infringement issue or circumvention? Starting from the, the second question, I think the easy question, the leading operating system is not copyright. Or circumvention. <laughs> well, the question is, is, is there a, is there a PPM that needs to be circumvented in order to have the certainty to need to the operating system? That seems to be the assertion of the need here. It's a factual issue. I don't know. I don't have the factual answer to that question. I, the reason I raise that is if you look at the at the, uh, uh, the the software, the SFLC submission on page ten. It says, while modification of the pre-installed operating system is sometimes necessary to circumvent an application lock, the same is not true of OS locked operating system locks. Removal of device's default operating system does not require its reproduction, derivation, distribution, performance, or display, and so can I infringe you know, section 107. I think that's, that's Jesse's point. It struck me that uh, I'm not sure you would need to access it in order to do it. So I, I don't know whether there's any circumvention on that. Well, that's, I mean, I think there's there are definitional issues here that, that aren't easily resolved by resort to, the, um, to any cases or to the, to the statute itself. Um, I, it's possible that I could be proven wrong on my statement uh, in there that for every mobile operating system, no need to uh, perform any modification of the operating system to get the necessary permissions to remove it. Um, there are, you know, as I understand it, essentially three ways uh, in which users are prevented from uh, removing an operating system. One is simply withholding administrative rights, which makes it impossible to delete so at least some portions of the operating system because you simply don't have the leak access. Um, another is to uh, actually the operating system so that the firmware, yeah, so that the system will not boot an unsigned operating system. And that's another type of measure that's used to prevent users from installing a new operating system, but it also controls access to, I believe, the operating system that is loaded. And then yet a, a third and further measure is to uh, encrypt uh, the bootloader to make it impossible to even install a new bootloader that would then install unsigned 
there are various measures employed. I think that all of them can certainly be construed to control access to the existing operating system, therefore causing there to be a Section 1201A violation when you serve that. That's very clear. Was that in your comments? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure if, if, a, if that uh, all of that was, was stated. Um, I just have a couple more questions. Yes. I do one more thing on that. Um, as I believe the only computer systems engineer on this panel today, uh, <clears throat> if you have burned into read-only memory, soldered into the circuit board of the computer, a tiny program that says you can't load anything that I don't want you to load, then it becomes, from a practical point of view, impossible to load another operating system on top, unless you can somehow wipe that read-only memory chip and reprogram it. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but one, the reasonable man test would say somebody could call that circumvention. Uh, but from a practical point of view, it just makes it impossible for even very astute people to make that change of operating system because there are read-only memories that are actually read-only. Once they're burned, that's it. They can't be reflashed. You've, you've burned out little pathways in the chip, and it will only do one thing. It is then a one-trick pony. Can I end up putting that back to copyright owners? Is that is there any copyright interest in preventing someone from completely wiping the device? It's not a copyright. I think Jesse already said. I mean, it's, it's not. It may be a twelve oh one issue, but the question is: Is it some? Is twelve oh one somehow protecting a copyright interest, or is it protecting a hardware interest? Well, I, I know that that the office has made this bifurcation of what uh, interest is being uh, affected. I, I think just looking at the statute, uh, the question of installing a new operating system is, I think, totally irrelevant to this proceeding. I must have mis misunderstood. I'm sorry. It, it, it's no, no. It, it, it's a it circumvention has a definition, and it has to do with access to a copyrighted work. So, uh, if you're removing the existing operating system, the question is, do you need to have access to it in order to do that? So that if there isn't, whether it's in the form of ROM or some other form, uh, if there is a access control mechanism that you have to circumvent in order to do that, then then we're in the right then we're at the right table here. But if not, not. We're at the right table, but we're not necessarily asking the right question, right? So if the, the question would be if in order to obtain access to the copyrighted work, in order to protect the copyright interest in that work, or is, or is the purpose of getting access to that work to completely obliterate the work? And I think those are slightly different things where you're not actually going to use the copyrighted work in any way in the second, in the latter case. Your, and so access is just being used sort of as the, of the copyrighted work could be being used as the hook there for I, I, I suppose if the purpose. only purpose of the access control mechanism was to prevent the obliteration of the work, which qualifies is that your question? I, 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 that, I think that's, that, I'm not sure what the answer to that question is, but in this case, I think if there is an access control in the operating system, that's probably not its only purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think this comes back to really a security issue. That's, that's the, the main reason why you put these, these sorts of locks in place to prevent tampering with the operating system in a way that's harmful to the user. So, um, I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think I think at the end of the day, there are some real factual questions here. And you know, I come back to what I said at the beginning, which is that it is the burden of proponents of these exceptions to establish that what they're really talking about here is circumvention of the dumb access control for a non infringing purpose, and that there is a substantial adverse impact. 
So, you know, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, I can't answer the technical question right now. Um, but I think, in, in essence, the, uh, the burden is on comments to answer the technical question and just proceed. Can I just ask, say, for example, it is possible to think about this, that the DRM is a physical thing in a phone or a laptop or any other computing device, and I took a tool and ripped it out, would that be an act of circumvention? Yes, we would say that we were avoiding bypassing or... Yeah, I, guess I don't <laughs> think extracting is in there, but... <laughs> no, 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 I, I own the phone, not the software, but it's embedded in a chip, and I just took out the chip, that would be a circumvention. Well, this that is control chip controlling access to a copyrighted work. Right. And, and I think by... Just by the 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 yeah, yeah, just put it in the and destroy it. So, I'm just trying to... Similarly, as if you took a chip and, and soldered it into your uh, your video game console in order to circumvent act, uh, an access control on the operating system of that. I mean, it could, it could be an hardware, it could be a software. So remove is the word in the statute. Okay. Yes. Steve construed the issue as whether um, you need to access within the meaning of the act the copyrighted work in order to remove it. And I don't think that's the issue under the statute. I think the issue is first whether the uh, technological protection measure controls access to the copyright work, and then whether your use is not infringing. And here, I think particularly, I mean, if, if we think, if we'll take the example of one type of technology. procedure, um, in that case, that, that signature or that, that encryption scheme does control access to copyrighted work. We only want to circumvent it for purposes of removing the operating system of that. I think mean, that those are the two steps we're concerned about. Just briefly, I, I think that when the law was passed, nobody would have considered that access to a copyrighted work means a popular song which you obtain either legally or illegally. And then the whole, there's some piece of software that stops you from putting it up on your personal website and making it freely available, assuming it's under a restrictive license. That's what they focus on. This is a completely different question. It's, a, it's a merely a coincidence. It's a misuse. They're homonyms. Actually, the proprietary OS is a copyrighted work. That I don't doubt. Accessing it, when you're fiddling with the bootloader or modifying the bootloader or something, not, if the DMCA, and this is part of the reason I always say it doesn't deal with copyright, for many reasons, I think, look, that's not, but you're not copying something and making profit by distributing it. That's not what happens. You want to put your own operating system on it, and the use of the word access to remove it, it's, it's more like it's not quite a pure coincidental comment. There's some sense of access, but it ain't the same thing. Um, removing the uh, whatever little thing is on the song and then redistributing it. That is, that is a thousand miles from my putting my operating system on the piece of hardware that I bought. It just doesn't have, And the other side, by the way, I want to thank them for their absolute honesty. Um, this is maybe a new question for them. They hear it and they tell the truth. They don't know it sounds different. You know, yeah. Except what, just a couple more things, and then it's two minutes later. Jesse, you had made a statement, well, a number of statements um, in the opening. Is that part of the record, some of the um, assertions that you've made, or are these something new outside the records? In other words, do we already have this yes. on hand? The statistics? The, yes. Those are, well, those are, uh, I'm not sure those are in the uh, articles that we sent to you. It's, they're, they're all from, uh, from public art. Right, just like to pass some substantiation to what you say, so we're going to put it in the record. And the last question is, we're going back to this issue of a tablet. How really can you define what a tablet is? I mean, from what I heard, it's a small computer that holds in your hand. I mean, is that, is that enough for us to go forward to say that they've established the class upon which we can grant an exemption? Martha? May I? Yes. So we thought this might come up. <laughs> so we took a stab at a definition. And what we did is we, we took a look at a bunch of the definitions that are out there. 
Uh, there are some from various magazines, there are some from uh, companies like Intel, and we try to, to identify some of the common factors, and so this is what we suggest. A tablet computer is a personal mobile computing device, typically featuring a touchscreen interface that contains hardware technically capable of running a wide variety of programs, that is designed with technological measures that restrict the installation or modification of programs on that device, and is not marketed primarily as a wireless telephone handset. Could you read that to us one more time? Yes. <laughs> and of course, we would be happy to put this in the record as well. I think you are. Yes, you have. A tablet computer is a personal mobile computing device typically featuring a touchscreen interface that contains hardware technically capable of running a wide variety of programs that is designed with technological measures that restrict the installation or modification of programs on the device and is not marketed primarily as a wireless telephone handset. Okay, the first part of that I follow and mm -hmm. I, I get. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure why you are including in the definition of a tablet the fact that it contains technological measures that control access. Mm -hmm. uh, why should that be part of a definition of a tablet? I can well imagine a tablet which has, a tablet which has no technological measures on it of that nature. Right. Well, you know, I think we were thinking about this in the context of our uh, definition of our proposed class. And we were trying to define um, a device that uh, met the criteria that we were seeking an exemption for. And so the reason that we put that in there is because we wanted to make clear that we're talking about um, a situation where a, a device has certain technological protection measures that um, uh, make it impossible for a, a consumer in the ordinary course of things to install or, or modify programs on the device. But um, if, if the goal is simply to <coughs> define what a tablet is out of the context of that particular proposed class, that might not be necessary. For the same reason, we said it's not marketed primarily as a wireless telephone handset because we wanted to differentiate it from a smartphone, which is also in our proposed class. Okay, I think it's probably unfair to ask people to react to it, but I can ask and you can decline. <laughs> But, but, but any reactions at this point? I, I need to see it on paper. That's fine. Okay. So, so um, let, let's do this. Uh, uh, this is a new and potentially helpful suggestion. If you could, um, it'll take us a little while to get that transcript back. So if you could give us the actual, maybe email us the actual text. We will send it to everyone on this panel. And so we'll ask people to react to us within 10 days, please. Yes. Great. We can do that because we still have free unfettered use of computers. <laughs> yeah. well, better make it seven days just in case. Uh, <laughs> 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 That'd be Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much, folks. Um, thank you. Thank you. We are running behind, but I at least need some time to reflash my memory. So <laughs> <laughs> let's reconvene at 4:15. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's good.